No. <laughs> this is not good. I had my son, had my son on the computer here. Ah, I know what it is. Right here. Got to plug it in. There we go. <laughs> that is not good. Starting late. Starting late and on a Thursday of all days. Of all possible days that I could be late. And it happens to be Thursday. <laughs> One of the, you know, days of the week. I hate that. <laughs> but I love this. I love this. This is Paleocrat Diaries. And I am your boy, the Kaiser. The one and only Jeremiah Bannister. We are going to rock it out today. We're going to do the best job that we possibly can. And of course, we're professionals. But we're especially professional because we take a knee for Christ the King. Every single day that we resolve deep down inside to never give up, to keep on smiling, and to remember one day we are going to croak and die. <laughs> We're gonna die. You're gonna breathe your final breath, and you don't know when, and neither do I. Okay, we could be doing anything in the world. You could slip on something in the house, fall down the steps when you're going downstairs. What well, doesn't matter. Could be anything in the world, choking on a chicken bone. <laughs> you never know. It could be today. <sighs> So what do you gotta do? You gotta take a knee for Christ the King. You need to resolve every thought, word, and deed right now for the rest of your life, beginning right now, right now, to Him. Thought, word, and deed, fuse that together. Bring it in a complete alignment with the divine constitution of the visible church. And you know what? Right now, there's no better time. In fact, there's no better time than, you know, mm, right now, at every moment of every single day to do this. But we happen to be living in a pretty wicked world right now. It's all sorts of messed up. We got nihilism all around us. Relativism, subjective, subjectivism, weird kinds of vitalism, spooky mysticism and all the weirdness all around. And we're going to be talking about that. <laughs> we are going to be talking about that. I was wondering why in the world do I have no audio? Why do I have no audio? And well, because it was unplugged. And I still think it was my son. <laughs> I think my son Athanasius did that to me. Ugh. Yeah, you know what? Wolfie, Louie, you're fired. I'm firing my kids right now. Three years old, one and a half years old. Kick their butt to the curb. <laughs> Send them packing. No little lunches either. Ugh. Yeah, no lunches for them. <laughs> They're little snack packs and fruit snacks. None of that. They don't get any of it. They're supposed to be in here making sure that Papa has everything under control. Because obviously, obviously I do not. Obviously I do not. But you know what? What would it mean in this world to keep on smiling and to never give up and all that if you never made mistakes and you never messed up and you never irritated yourself or you were never irritated by others or things outside your control? It would be meaningless. What would the point be? Everybody would be, well, I'm always smiling. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm, I never give up. Just, why would I? I mean, everything's going perfectly. I never make a mistake. So that very, that very idea behind that assumes outright that your life is probably, if you're anything like me, um, and I pray for you if you are, <laughs> but if you're anything like me, riddled with mistakes. Riddled, riddled, riddled with mistakes. All right. Well, let me get my glasses on here. Let me get my glasses on here. Yeah, I mean, everything's different. It, the, the LUT is different. The colors, all this. I don't know how I feel about it. I don't know how I feel. Tell me in the comment section, speaking, by the way, of comment sections. I'm going to pull this one up right now. Check that out. Not Oh, oh hold on. There were, where, where did they all go? Where did they all go? Okay, yeah, there we go. Yeah, uh, whale standard time. Yes, it is whale standard time, in fact. It is. Uh, Kaiser standard time is whale standard time. And Kaiser Standard Time, for those who don't know, it just means any time that I happen to pop online. Now, if you want to connect with me, do as Rachel did right here, okay? Rachel wrote, good afternoon, all. Where's the mustache, meaning of Catholic? My son convinced me to shave it off. I'm a little bit sad about it. I'm not going to lie. I, you know, there, there's something manly, I think, about a stash. There's just something manly about it. And, uh, you know, the thing is, once you shave it, it's like something just is missing. You're not, you're not the man you used to be. You know what I mean? Does that make any sense? <laughs> you're a lady, so maybe you won't, maybe you won't understand. But, oh, no. Uh-oh. 
Yeah, maybe you might not understand that. I'm hoping you don't, right? If you got a mustache, don't tell me that. <laughs> don't tell me, you know, but but it's true. And plus, I you know, there's part above my upper lip. It's kind of little. I don't have like the MacGyver stash. I don't have a, the top of my lip part doesn't go down to here <laughs> like it does on old Tom Selleck. That guy you can only imagine that dude without a mustache. It'd be really weird, I bet. Seriously, I bet he looks like Bart Simpson. Bet he's got a Bart, a Bart Simpson face. Okay, before we move on, real quick, I just want to tell you, you need to go and check out The Saint Maker. You're going to learn a whole bunch here in just a few seconds. But I want to tell you, um, I recently, when I, when I told everybody, when, I, when the kids went back to school, it's kind of like we're all going back, right? We're all going back to school. We're all figuring stuff out. We're all getting back in a routine here in the Team Tiny Dancer house at Castle Paleocrat in Grand Rapids. And my kids are back, right? They're back in school. Everything's starting to get into gear. But I, I quickly realized, you know what? Getting up and going to Mass, frequenting the sacraments, knowing what feast day it is, um, it, making sure that I have my appointments laid out and on time. Tomorrow, won't be able to do a normal show at a normal time because I have an appointment tomorrow, okay? So that sort of thing, to be, to be aware of that. And for a long time, I've allowed myself to say, oh, I got to talk to my wife. She's the keeper of the keys. That's a very important thing to communicate with your wife, but not to just rely on it like, well, she's my calendar and I'm oblivious to it. Those sorts of things and, and plotting out, I've got a lot of things that I want to do. Plotting out, how is this going to happen? What's the time frame? When are these things going to be launched? All of that, those things are all taken into consideration by the people who created the Saint Maker. And they brought together all the, the knowledge and the science of time and, and how, how it's best laid out, how you structure your day, and fused that with the wisdom of the saints. And in doing that, have given you and me an amazing tool to do a better job with our time that we can at least get closer to that place where St. Alphonsus resolved that for the remainder of his life, he would not waste a moment of time. I don't live up to that, okay? I find myself wasting time an awful lot, um, but I'm getting better at it. And part of that has been the familiarity with the, the tools available and the way that it's laid out in the Saint Maker. So with no further ado, we'll go ahead and do that. If you do not have your coffee, and where's mine? That's another thing. If you haven't fired Athen, fire him too. <laughs> He's gotta go. Ugh. I told him, I said, give me something to drink, dude. Oh, wait. seriously, it's like I'm supposed to do stuff for myself. <laughs> I'm talking about the same maker. It's got everything. And here I am just all, you know, if only they had a mini saint maker for people who do shows with checklists on stuff to do. <laughs> if only they had that. But if you don't have your coffee yet, you don't have your straw, you don't have whatever it is you're going to be drinking during the show, you're going to need it because it's going to be a good one. We're talking, of course, about nihilism, the root of the Revolution of the Modern Age by Eugene Father Seraphim Rose. We're going to be talking today about the appendix, actually. We're skipping ahead a chapter, and then we'll go back. Two chapters, actually, and then we'll go back. But I wanted to touch on this first, on absurdism. So as soon as we are done here with the Saint Maker promo, we'll be right back, and we'll be doing the analysis of nihilism in about, I don't know, 90 seconds. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? Not by itself. But in our day and age of addictive apps and glowing screens, we're bombarded by constant distraction. And our quest for sainthood often takes a backseat. The Saint Maker is the first high performance planner for the spiritual life made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. It's a work of genius, really, fusing the wisdom of the saints with the science of personal productivity. It's rigorous, but sainthood is tough. And most of us need help organizing our time, our work, our leisure, and our devotion because that can help you become a saint. The Saint Maker is elegant, fits in your purse or briefcase, and is a perfect companion for your missal, Bible, or rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal-setting pages, confession journals, and more. It's why the Saint Maker is used by hardworking Catholics like CEO of Sock Religious Scott Williams, best-selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Amber Schneider, a Catholic wife Dina Barca, and Brian Holdsworth, and priests like Father Corey Stitcher. 
Try the Saint Maker out. And if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. So go right now. Find your life planner at thesaintmaker.com. Quantities are limited though. So head on over to thesaintmaker.com to order yours and to start your Saint Maker journey today. You got to do it. You got to go over right now, thesaintmaker.com slash Diaries link in description below. All right. Right there is the sound. It's going right now all around the world, everywhere, all around the world, to the north, to the south, the east, and the west, letting everyone know that your boy, the Kaiser, Paleocrat, the one and only, the OG, is on the air right now. And that we're going to be talking about something super hot to try, super amazing, to equip you as a Catholic, as a believer in our Lord Jesus Christ, that you are going to be equipped to better understand the chaos of the world that we're in to get an idea for the portrait, the landscape, and and deeper than that, to get down to the roots, not just philosophically, right? But theologically, what is the spirit of this thing? It's Antichrist, it's demonic, straight up, and it's all around us. It's all around us, it's trying to devour us. In fact, in many ways, it's already taken a nibble here and a nibble there, and it's all sorts of messed up. And we've gotta figure out how are we going to deal with this? And one thing I've learned is that every single age has its own problems. And when they come with those problems, there are those who would like to stick to a tried and true presentation that says, this is how you deal with it. It worked a thousand years ago. And you go, but before them, they were doing something different. And before them, they were doing something different. Building on one another, challenging, uh, providing for the defect, providing for it, saying, look, we're making good on this. We're dealing with different problems, and the, tr- and the fact is, we're in an arms race right now. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of man are in an arms race, going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and the devil is a roaring lion. He's seeking who he can devour, and he's coming for you. He's coming for your kids, too. So we've got to know, what is this we're up against? We need to sit around in the war room and look at this thing, map it out, and say, this is, the, this is the place right here that we're able to stop it dead in its tracks. Because if we don't, it's only gonna get worse and worse and worse. You're made for a time like this. So am I. You ought to be pumped up and grateful, glad in fact, that you have the opportunity to be alive at this exact moment because the God that made you wanted it that way. And he wanted it that way for an awesome reason. So look around you and smile. There's fire. There's smoke, it's true. But the world is a lot better because it has, you know, folks like me and you. It's true. Totally, 100% true. Oh, by the way, uh, let's see here. Who's this guy? Where's the mustache guy in the comments? Yeah, uh, I know, man. That's another thing. I think my I think my son set me up with that, too. He's like, oh, yeah, your mustache like totally sucks, dude. You need to, you know, shave that mustache. And I'm like, really? You think so? Yeah, I definitely do. I think he was joking. I think the guy was joking. I'm looking at myself now. I don't even recognize. Who's this guy in the picture? Somebody's hijacked my computer. <laughs> I'm seeing some dude here with no upper lip. What's up with that? At least with a mustache. I mean, it looked manly, you know? It looked manly. I looked like I'd be like a, you know, a really cool pirate or something. <laughs> like, or one of those dudes in like, you know, one of those old Clint Eastwood movies, you know? Sitting there, have the, the, the gun with the belt that's kind of cocked a little to the side. Sitting there, having a little smoke. Having a little eatsy smoke. All right. By the way, if you would like to connect with me on the show, during the show, make sure to put at the meaning of Catholic. That will connect you in a way that we will be able, I'll be able to see it. Otherwise, I'm kind of just going through everything in the world. And so make sure, make sure that if you would like to get, have a question or a comment, a criticism, doesn't matter, any of those things, make sure, put at the little symbol, the meaning of Catholic. Make sure, because then it'll pop up. It'll be orange and very easy for me to see. I will, however, make one exception because it plays into this topic, okay? Uh, Lisa Polanski says, what do we do when we've reached the point that we just want to say, be gone, heretic, be gone, schismatic? You've reached that point. Um, remember the prodigal son, okay? Remember the prodigal son. Because, you know, we... <laughs> I have to imagine, I have to imagine that that attitude may have, may have kind of cropped up, right? Peaked his little head at the older brother, 
the other brother, right? And and to sit there and the kind of uh, uh, being upset, taking for granted the things that were in the home, taking for granted uh, uh, the love of the father, the things that the family provided, and then for that person to deviate and to go away. It's one of those things, it's easy, isn't it? It's easy to, to get upset about these sorts of things. And I, I prayed something yesterday, and I want to pray it again today, actually. The exact same thing as we prayed last time. Because I think it plays in exactly with what Lisa is talking about. So I think if we pray about it, and this is, this is old school, okay? And it mentions schismatics and heretics, okay? Specifically. So this prayer, it uses those words. <laughs> so it's awesome. And this is from, I think, a 1938 um, manual of devotions. People can find these. They used to give them for like confirmations and baptisms, stuff like that. Um, but this is a prayer that when I came back from, the, uh, from falling away, I was an apostate. I was a, an antichrist, antitheist for seven years of my life and came back to the church in 2017. God is good. And there were people that said, be gone to me. And there were people who weren't, who did not do that. The people who did not say be gone are people to this very day who are very close to me. In fact, one of them is my son's godfather. And so those individuals that those individuals that are, are um, committed to the endeavor of saying, I care about that person, I can see beyond the silliness or stupidity or the malice. I can see beyond that. And within them, I can see the dignity of a man or a woman who is created in the image of God, who is, is there uh, to be drawn into the likeness of God, right? We're not just vestiges, okay? We were made in his image and we're drawn into the likeness, becoming more like him. And that I can see through that and recognize that that person that upsets me badly has done nothing as bad as what those those people who were standing at the foot of the cross did to our Lord when he said, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. If he can do that, and they were way guiltier, okay, more immediate of a problem, he's on the cross, he's dying. And in that moment, he was able to, we ought to be like him. And this is one way, because in, in honesty, we don't. We're, we're, we're not like that very often. It's really tough. And because we, we're not the Lord, <laughs> we strive to be like the Lord, but we are not him. And so this is one of those prayers that's helped me. And we'll pray it today too. Okay. So here we go. In nomine Patris, Fili, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. With that most profound respect, which divine faith inspires, O oh my God and Savior, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, I adore thee. And with my whole heart, I love thee hidden in the most august sacrament of the altar, in reparation for all the irreverences, profanations, and sacrileges that I, to my shame, may have until now committed, as also for all those that have been committed against thee, or that may be ever committed for the time to come. I offer to thee, therefore, O oh my God, my humble adoration, not indeed such as thou art worthy of, nor such as I owe thee, but such at least as I am capable of offering. And I wish that I could love thee with the most perfect love of which rational creatures are capable. In the meantime, I desire to adore thee now and always, not only for those Catholics who do not adore or love thee, but also to supply the defect, and for the conversion of all heretics, schismatics, libertines, atheists, blasphemers, sorcerers, Mohammedans, Jews, and idolaters, Ah, yes, my Jesus, mayest thou be known, adored, and loved by all, and may thanks be continually given to thee in the most holy and august sacrament. Amen. In nomine Patris, Fili, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. That, to me, is the key. Because we can read all day long. We, we, can, we can read about all different apologetic methods. We can read about what we should do, what's the best argument, how can I make this better, and all of that. I do a lot of that stuff on the show. But if we're not the kind of person who's going to get on our knees when we're alone and pray, and pray for those people to supply the defect for our brothers and sisters in the Lord, 
And that, that, that means there's a defect big time, that there's something there that, that's missing. There's something, and, and sometimes what's missing is ignorance, right? It's rooted in an ignorance or it's rooted in something just really just downright emotional or psychological or a mishap and a misunderstanding or something that was extraordinarily tragic and that, that for, for whatever reason, they were unable and there's a, there's a bunch of different reasons why this kind of thing happens. Unable to imagine that a good and loving God could possibly allow that. It caused enormous amounts of doubt, enormous amounts of frustration. And so for us to be there, not only in person, not only to argue, but to really love them into the kingdom, to really care about them and to, sh- and, and to show them even, even, and especially When no one's around, it's just us and God, that we are going to pray for them, to think about them, to say their names aloud, and to commit to that idea, not just once, but to say, God, I'm going to beat the door down. I'm going to knock and knock and knock and knock until my hands are bleeding from knocking, but I will not stop because love, because I love them. Not to win an argument, but because I love them. It's a great question though, Lisa. And I only say this because I have to remind myself too. Because I struggle in the same way you're talking about. You know, we live in a bad time. We live in a time, you know, that says here there are many signs Right, that the world has begun to move out, in fact, of the age of nihilism since the end of the last great war towards some kind of new age. But in any case, this new age, if it comes, will not see the overcoming of nihilism, but its perfection. In other words, it's going to be even worse. <laughs> it's going to be wicked bad. We thought it was bad before. Holy cow. We don't even know what's coming. We're getting a foretaste now. It's an era and an age of pure power, power politics. Even in culture, the, 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 the kind of mobs, outrage mobs that come after people. The way that it's turned into this really cynical game of just pure power and, and information warfare. The revolution reveals its truest face in nihilism without repentance. And there has been none. What comes after can only be a mask hiding the same face. I love that, by the way. The idea that no matter what comes, if there's no apology, if there's no repentance for what has been done, then it's going to remain on that track. And what is that track? That track is of such a nature that there is no room in a consistent modern philosophy for God at all. All further modern thought, whatever disguises it may assume, must presuppose this. It must be built upon the void that's left by the quote-unquote death of God. The revolution, in fact, cannot be completed until the last vestige of faith in the true God is uprooted from the hearts of men and everyone has learned to live in the void. Don't you feel that, by the way? Don't you feel that in society that we live in a, in a day and age where we're, we're left to the void? That we have to We have to understand and appreciate that there is no meaning. There is no purpose. There is no direction. It's just what you make it. And this this fraud that I think deep down inside everybody knows. And that's the fraud of saying, you know, you don't need an ultimate end. You don't need to have a a beginning, a purposeful beginning, or a, a, a purposeful aim and end to your life to be enjoying the good times now and to give meaning to the moment. So out of nothingness, meaning comes. Out of the void, meaning comes. Out of nothing, nothing comes. It's a fraud. It's a, it's a complete lie. And deep down inside, everybody knows. It's like, it's like saying, well, it's almost like uh, interpretive dance. Everybody's got their own interpretation. They're all dancing around like weirdos. And you go, what are you doing? I'm, I'm dancing. For what? I'm doing interpretive dance. For what? I don't know. 
feels good in the moment. It's like a dog sniffing in the air, seeing if it's that time of the month for any of the lady dogs. You say, well, at that point, you are a vestige. At that point, you're not even in the image anymore. You've just completely found yourself right back down to the most basic and brute instincts of the human animal. That's it. And it's incoherent. In the moment, you can give whatever meaning to that that you want. And in your own little universe, in your own little head, that's your meaning. And at best, it's meaning, I guess, to you. You say, but I have a lot of meaning right now in this moment. Flash in a pan. Flash in a pan, here today, gone tomorrow. It's like grass that comes and grows and fades and it's burned up in fire. It's gone. To be remembered no more. And that's the very best that they have to offer. That is the best, is a, is a facade, an illusion of meaning in the moment. From faith comes coherence. The world of faith, which was once the normal world, is a supremely coherent world. Because in it, everything is oriented to God as to its beginning and end. And it obtains its meaning in that orientation. Yeah. Yeah. Where you begin, it affects, we're we're really big about that on the show, aren't we? We talk about that harmony, that, that symphony that's going on between the beginning, the means, and the end. We say those things work in harmony together. It's like, it's like being on a walk, a meaningful walk that says one foot in the past, one foot in the, in the future, going ahead, and my head right now in the present. And in that balance of things, I find purpose and meaning. Interconnectivity, in fact, not this isolating meaninglessness that goes on in our nihilistic secular age. Nihilistic rebellion in destroying that world has inspired a new one. It's a world of the absurd. But if nothingness be at the center of that world, then the world both in its essence and in every detail is incoherent. It fails to hold together. It is absurd. We see this, by the way, we're going to see what Nietzsche had to say about it. Right? We're going to see that. But we, we, we see this all the time in, the, in that void, in that absence, even just societally speaking, just, just saying, well, hey, look at the way, the, the way that it manifests itself. Because that's how the spirit works its way through. You will see manifestations of the void. And you'll have void over here, void over there. And eventually it becomes this engulfing abyss. It's a sinkhole, straight to hell. And you look and you say, what has replaced meaning? What has replaced a a kind of um, teleological uh, uh, purpose and aim in life that we're going in a particular direction, that we have uh, intelligibility with what we know and meaningfulness in history, that there's a purpose to it, not just some grab bag of what I want, or what I think, or what I feel in the moment for myself, but something collective, something that's not just the many and diverse, but truly one, and says there is a purpose for this. And what happens? Well, in that world, in that world, you end up having pure power. Pure power, and pure power by numbers. Man, I got to... I don't know if I got a hair in my nucky. I got a hair or something in my nose. I'm like, what the heck? On the outside of it. And so the thing is, you sit there and you say, pure power politics, pure power in our culture that says, look, look at the outrage mob. Each one in their own little brains, angry, fueled, emotional, passionate. Ah, I can't believe he said that. Ah, I can't believe she dared to think that. Ah. 
Get your fire out. Get your pitchforks out. We need to go, go get them. <laughs> you say, for what? For what? You got a Ten Commandments or something? Who came down the mountain? Do you have plagues or something that verified this? Or is this just you and your buddies winging it like crazy weirdos? Violent, malicious, insatiable weirdos. They don't, what, what, what is their standard? What is it? Is it universal? They don't even believe in that. Or if they do, if they do, they just stumbled on it. And if you ask them based on what, where do you even get the idea of a universal in your weird godless worldview? They don't even know. They have no clue. And so they don't even, they're all winging it. For all different reasons, they're winging it with no authority, with no normative standard, none. And there's no rules that apply for like a moral theology that says, well, if you do this particular sin or this particular crime, it'd be based on this. And here's, here's the institution that would deal with that. And here's what the proper recourse is. And if you'd like to be redeemed or have any kind of reconciliation, this is what you do. And mind your own business if it's not your problem. And all of those things, there, and there's a bazillion considerations. All of those things are gone. They're gone. In that nihilistic hellscape, those things are gone. But then you say, well, if that's the case, not only are you getting involved in something that's none of your business, everything becomes their business. Do you think you're going overboard? There is no rule about overboard. Should you help restore the man or reconcile? They have no redemption. That worldview has no redemption. It is an insatiable thing, this void and abyss insatiable, gluttonous, salivating at the teeth, desperate for more and more and more until finally, in the end, there's what? Nothing. Nothing. Nietzsche says this, in the very passage where he first proclaimed its first principle, the death of God, he said, we've killed him. God, you and I, we're all his murderers, but how have we done it? How are we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the whole horizon? What did we do when we loosened this earth from its sun? Whither does it move now? Whither do we move away from all suns? Do we not dash on unceasingly, backward, sideways, forward in all directions? Is there still an above and below? Do we not stray as though infinite nothingness? Does not empty space breathe upon us? Has it not become colder? Does not night come on continually darker and darker? Such is the nihilist universe in which there is neither up or down, right or wrong, true nor false, because there's no longer any point of orientation. Where there was once God, there's now nothing. There used to be authority, order, certainty, faith. Now we've got anarchy, confusion, arbitrary and unprincipled actions, doubt and despair. This is the universe so vividly described by the Swiss Catholic Max Picard as the world of the, quote, flight from God, and alternatively as the world of discontinuity and disjointedness. Nothingness, incoherence, antitheism, hatred of truth. What we've been discussing in these pages is more than mere philosophy, more even than a rebellion of man against a God he will no longer serve. There's a subtle intelligence that lies behind these phenomena. But today, rather than simply talk about that, I wanted to skip ahead to talk about the philosophy of the means. So they've denied, so we've talked about the origin. The origin is toast, okay? They don't believe, they don't want to orient themselves anymore to the God of the universe that created them, the triune God that we serve in the Catholic Church. 
They do not wish to serve that God. They loathe him. And they know that they know that he's not dead because they're still thinking and talking and living and moving and having their being too. They can't get around that. But they want nothing to do with him. And in fact, worse than that, whether whether passively or actively, they are they are moving forward in such a way as not just to disregard him, but to smack him in the face. Of course, as someone had said before, um, people would not be able, the unbeliever would not be able to smack the Lord in the face were the Lord not to first put him on his knee. In other words, even their ability to do that is, bang, is, is provided for. The ability, the, the, the preconditions necessary, those things required in order to do those heinous things would not be able to be provided by their worldview or by any other. That's the contention on this show. Now, in the appendix, the philosophy of the absurd... The present age is, in a profound sense, the age of absurdity. Poets and dramatists, painters and sculptors proclaim and depict the world as a disjointed chaos. And man as a dehumanized fragment of that chaos. Politics, whether of the right, the left, or the center, can no longer be viewed as anything but an expedient whereby universal disorder is given, for the moment, a faint semblance of order. So in other words, in a world that is complete chaos, in a world that is complete, completely disjointed, completely disordered, in that world, the facades that we have, right, of order, like political parties, things like that, law, cultural norms and expectations, customs and courtesies, all these different things that we experience in our lives they're, they're a facade. And I contend that it's we are increasingly getting to the place where people are recognizing that it's a facade. That for a while, they were li- uh, society was living off the fumes of the past. They were living off of the, the hand-me-downs from a culture that was wrapped up with Christendom for a very long time. And because of that, because of that, there were certain ideas, even amongst people who may have called themselves atheists, even amongst people who were all different range of of philosophies and political views and everything else in our society that still was banking on the idea that inherited thing through time, like words, for example, the way that we benefit from the the hand-me-downs of words, accents, things that are really subtle that we don't really think of, but then when we start to see them go, there's a feeling of that. I don't know if any... If anyone tuning in right now has kind of lamented the loss in many ways of regional accents, but I have, I lament that, but that's something that happened over quite a bit of time. I've talked before about a video. My dad was on, um, uh, press your luck, right? Um, it was a game, you know, no whammies, no whammies. And if you had a whammy, it's a little, little cartoon guy. You couldn't get those, but you had a you had a board, and the light went around on all these squares, do 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 do, and you had to hit that button right at the right time to try to get the money or the prize, all that. My dad was on there, and back in that, it was about 1988, and oh no, 1984, I think, and he's on there, and went back and watched an episode not too long ago, and in that episode, he was like, name's Tim Bannister from Pennsylvania, rode my Goldwing motorcycle. He said motorcycle. <laughs> what's, a, what's a motorcycle? That is a word that I wish I heard more. Like that. And it's the same with, with our, our ideas and our values. I was talking to my kids about it this morning. We, we take for granted the idea that we are human beings. This is actually one of those things that's come under attack big time. Big time. With the idea of everything always being in a state of flux. With the idea of materialism, where do you find that being? Where do you find the continuity of your identity? In, in a materialistic universe of just material, just stuff everywhere that's constantly in a state of flux. Where do you find these things? You rely on them every day. You're tuning in right now to the same show, Paleocrat. Oh, it's Jeremiah. Is it still Jeremiah now? How about now? 
How about now? We could go on and on and on every nanosecond for the same reason that questions are asked, do you ever step in the same river twice? Those kind of questions that were debated and settled long ago, a lot of those questions are no longer taken for granted. People are starting to thaw from that and say, well, what happens in a world where everything is in flux? What happens to a world where we no longer have immateriality, that we no longer have um, a- any kind of thing like the soul, that there's no difference between the mind and the brain. And that after a while, the fumes are going to run dry. I've compared it to Christmas. I think we did it in a, one of the last episodes I did on this subject, talking about you know, people in a, in a world where you can already see Christmas has lost so much of its meaning. The mere fact that people have to uh, fight like tooth and nail, right? Fight tooth and nail for, for Christ to remain in Christmas. And you see these little, little things here and little things there. A manifestation of anti-Christmas sentiment in schools or one that's popped up in, a, in some kind of a local uh, city commission, or in Congress, or particular laws, or you start you start seeing it and hearing it in these little phrases, and it doesn't seem so bad I, in an isolated sense, where each little thing is its own little thing. But if you view it as there is a void beneath this surface, there is a void beneath this, and you're seeing the manifestations of that world, that, that grounding, falling into that abyss in little part by little part, and eventually it will get to such a place again it becomes a sinkhole. And eventually people will say, why do we even celebrate this holiday at all? They don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in the incarnation. They don't believe in a meaningful history. And if they did, or if they have come to believe in that, it's only modernity because all the people a long time ago were a bunch of dummies. Those people, they didn't know anything. I'm like way smarter than they are. And I'm like, that's also why you're like 400 pounds sitting around all day long on video games and looking at little digital devices and pornography all the time. Yeah, you're like really smart, dude. Blowing my mind. You're like a sage of the ages. Philosophers and other supposedly responsible men in government in academia, ecclesiastical circles, when they do not retreat behind the impersonal and irresponsible facade of specialization or bureaucracy, they usually do no more than rationalize the incoherent state of contemporary man in this world. They counsel a futile commitment to a discredited humanist optimism, to a hopeless stoicism, to blind experimentation and irrationalism, or to a commitment itself. It's a suicidal faith in faith. You got to have faith in what? In faith. Faith in faith. <laughs> but you say, why are you, what's the point of that? Do, and are we even way beyond this? He wrote this many, many years ago. Is it, is it the 50s or 60s? When was this? Many, many, many years ago when he first wrote it. Doesn't have the oh yeah it does it's right in the very right in the very intro, nineteen sixties. Yeah. Yeah, in the early sixties, we've gotten to that place though where you hear that right. We we the people are coming together. We are going to do this and that. Do you even recognize the we, the idea of we, the people, not just we people. You just can't even say we, just people. And at that point, if you give up on being becomings, <laughs> not even people anymore. Where do they get the idea of the oneness? Where do they get the idea? Right? I, I'm using that term idea intentionally. Where do they get that? The commonness of things, the redness of red. The softness of soft. Where do they get that? I had my kids yesterday. We're watching a, a series on philosophy together. And I, I, I had them write down. I said, I want you to draw as fast as you can. I want you to draw a heart. 
I want you to draw a moon. I want you to draw a star, sun. And they, they drew it out. Some of them, like the star, it doesn't, it's not really a star. But it's the idea that we have in our head, this kind of shared notion. Well, yeah, it's a little shape like this. Or a heart. Nobody drew it with the vowels and stuff. Nobody, nobody got serious about it. They were real quick. They have an idea of heartness. They have an idea of star, an idea of moon, an idea of person, people. As I said, red or chair ness, the ness of things, the dash N E S S that's at the end of words. They have that in their head. In this world here, where do we get that? And how bad is it, to be quite frank? How bad is it? When, when you sit there and you say, uh, you know, you see these politicians go up and they talk about some collective sense or they're either, they're either falling in a, in a way that says, you guys don't even believe or represent in any way any kind of collective oneness any unity at all because we're all dis we're not we're all in disunity we're all our own individual 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 person with relative and relative and relative beliefs and values and claims so i'd say look how do you even do that we don't even believe it they don't speak on behalf of anyone that's why we always joke when they talk about a mandate and we don't even believe that the groups that we're associated with in that structure even represent us. Republicans, Democrats, how many of you guys are like, oh yeah, man, Republicans are like big time representing my values. <laughs> how many people even think that about their churches anymore? We are so divided. Big time. They're going to see through the fraud. We're living on fumes. And those fumes are starting to run dry. They're starting to run out. But art, politics, and philosophy today are only reflections of life. And if they become absurd, it is because, in large measure, life has become absurd. By the way, in the comment, Light of Christ says, during capturing Christianity show today, an atheist commented that he's found no evidence of teleology. Thought to self, wouldn't you rather have a purpose to your life uh, versus not? If Well, he's on a show. His, the mere movements of his life, the fact that he doesn't off himself, like now, right? Or the fact that people would be sad if he did. That they don't just assume that somebody has a purpose. Uh, well, no, you know, he's okay. He could kill himself. You don't really know. I mean, he's just making up his own purpose in his own brain. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine people be like, well, uh, there, there's something, there's something within us that absolutely refuses to believe that. They can say that stuff all day long, yet they live their life as if there's a purpose. Otherwise, they're admitting that they're, they're like the people again in the, in the movie They Shoot Horses, don't they? Going around and around and around and around and around in this chaotic, meaningless thing. And for what? Because you got to do it, right? That's what this is all about. What's the purpose of that? For what? Well, I think so. Because they can't say, well, I mean, that's what it's about. Because then they're talking on behalf of other people. Which means there is a purpose outside of yourself. <laughs> so they can't even talk. They can't even talk without granting the idea that there is an aim and a purpose. Not just for one person, but for many. And of the many, one. The whole world, it almost seems, is divided into those who lead meaningless, futile lives without being aware of it, and those who, being aware of it, are driven to madness and suicide. Yeah. In the comments, how is it our human natures pine 
for extrinsic sufficiency. That is, we are always insufficient in and of and within ourselves. Nihilism is capable of answering this. Nihilism would find no reason to. There would be no... <laughs> to do that is to betray the most basic idea. I mean, what are they... They're trying to say, oh, well... And this is, this is the key of absurdism. We'll talk about that in a second. Ours is an age of absurdity in which the totally irreconcilable exists side by side, even in the same soul, where nothing seems to any purpose, where things fall apart because they have no center to hold them together. It's true, of course, that the business of daily life seems to proceed as usual, though at a suspiciously feverish pace. But men manage to get, get along, quote unquote, to keep on keeping on. Another day, another dollar running around in the circle. They shoot horses, don't they? To live from day to day. But that's because they do not or will not think. And one can hardly blame them for that. For the realities of the present day are not pleasant ones. Still, it is only the person who does think who does ask what, beneath the distractions of daily life, is really happening in the world. It's only such a person who can feel even remotely at home in the strange world that we live in today, or can feel that this age is, after all, normal. What a profound thing, by the way. What a profound statement. This idea. This idea that, that if a person were to think that they can, they can feel at home in this world. If they think about this and they begin to really ponder that they're able to feel at home. Why? For redemptive value, a redemptive purpose. For absurdism is a profoundly, or is a profound symptom of the spiritual state of contemporary man. And if we know how to read it correctly, we may learn much of that state. Because it's not a normal age in which we live, whatever their exaggerations and errors, however false their explanations, however contrived their worldview, the advanced poets, the avant-garde, right, the artists, and the thinkers of the age are at least right in one respect. There is something frightfully wrong with the contemporary world. And that's the first lesson that you can learn. But we have to ask ourselves this question. Can it actually be understood at all? If you take nihilism on its own claims, can it be, can it be in any way understood? How? How would it be coherent? If you don't have coherence in any degree at all, if you don't have coherence, then what is it? If it's nothingness and chaos, meaninglessness, no purpose, no aim, no origin. All kinds of balkanized in a bazillion different directions, always in a state of flux. How can you possibly come to some kind of a coherence in that? And even the question about coherence kind of betrays a little something, something. Kind of betrays a little something, something in there that even when they try to explain it, it's always hilarious to hear a nihilist try to argue the point true and at the end of the day if it's just his point who cares and why do people get upset if you go yeah that's his feelings oh that dude over there doesn't like rape oh yeah he doesn't like like Mr. Mustache Man over in Germany oh he doesn't like like uh, you know, genocide and stuff like that. That's just his opinion. <laughs> and if you go, Dude, what? How dare you? Then immediately you're saying one of two things. Either that thing is bad outside of itself, like outside of the person's brain, outside of their personal preference, outside of the moment of that happening. You say there is something, there is something intrinsically good, intrinsically bad. There is something that, that transcends that we can go, dude, I don't care that dude says that, he's wrong. Or you're just a crazy person who's thumping your chest and threatening people, and that's all it is. 
unsurprising if that's the case. We live in, a, in this day and age of narcissism, sadomasochism, all over the place. How dare you, buddy? How dare you deny that? Hey, I have the right to my opinion. No, you don't. And then you go in another place in another situation, and that person's up on stage, we all have the right to our opinion, you can't tell me what to believe, blah, blah, blah. Incoherence in the same person. Completely contradictory views. Completely contradictory. In most of the works of contemporary existentialism, and in the apologies of modern art and drama, it would seem the intel that intelligence has been almost totally abandoned. Critical standards are replaced by a vague sympathy or involvement and by extra logical, if not illogical arguments that cite the spirit of the age or some vogue creative impulse or an indeterminate awareness. But these are not arguments. <laughs> they are at best rationalizations. Wow, that's a neat rationalization you got floating between the ears in your skull. Wow, good. That's great. That's great. I don't think that's true at all. I think that's garbage trash. I think we should burn it all down. How dare you? We're just back to that again. Over and over and over and over and over. Which again is why they thrive in numbers. They latch on. Like globs of globs of this and globs of that turning into a big blob of that. To then come at you, guns a blazing, torches blazing, wanting your head on a pike. If we follow that path, we may end, we may end with a greater appreciation of absurdist art but hardly with any profounder understanding of it. Absurdism, indeed. And listen to this. This is one of those things. This is one of those things that I'm like, preach it. Come on now. Come on. And this goes back to something Sean said earlier in the comments. Absurdism, indeed, may not be understood at all on its own terms. So, on the one hand, people want you to understand what they're saying about absurdism and about nihilism and the purpose and what it's all about, <laughs> right? The purpose of nihilism, to, wait, we're going in a direction or something? Kind of weird. Because we can't understand it because understanding is coherence. And that is the very opposite of absurdity. <laughs> I mean, come on. Come on. Yeah, John Boy says talking heads have reduced the truth down to opinions. Totally true. We watched a documentary, by the way, over at the Wolfpack chat on Telegram. The link's in the description. We watched a, a movie called uh, Best of Enemies. It was really good uh, about Gore Vidal and William Buckley Jr. and how that whole talking head thing really first kind of started <laughs> with this. And, but it goes back and, he'll, and he addresses this too. And says why, we, why we're not going to be able to escape the way that so many people would like to try to escape. But listen to this. If we're to understand the absurd at all, it must be from the standpoint outside absurdity. A standpoint from which a word like understanding has a meaning. Only thus we may cut through the intellectual fog within which absurdism conceals itself. It's one of those things, the only way to understand absurdism is by, which is an all-inclusive statement about the, the nature and conditions of the world, and of man, and of our thoughts, and of our beliefs, and of our actions. The only way to analyze and to understand that is to, in fact, presuppose the opposite. You can find a deviation from something if there's a norm. But if the norm, if there's a norm that is, is coherent, then you can say, well, yeah, okay, here is a deviation from coherence, and this is the reasons why. And those reasons would be coherent. They would make sense, not only in and of themselves, in so much as they reflect what is physically happening, 
but within a scheme that makes sense of that. A system. But if everything in the system is inherently absurd, then you have a, you have a difficult time. It's like you can understand how being can come or how uh, becoming can come from being. That makes sense. All right? If we are beings, we can be beings in a state of becoming. Makes sense. But if everything is simply in a state of flux at all times, it's a difficult sell. We must, in short, take a stand. See. Only thus may we cut through the intellectual fog, right? Discouraging, it says uh, that it's con- uh, absurdism conceals itself. Discouraging coherent and rational attack by its own assault on reason and coherence. We must, in short, take a stand within a faith opposed to the absurdist faith and attack it in the name of a truth of which it denies the existence. In the end, we shall find that absurdism, quite against its will, offers its own testimony to this faith and this truth, which are, let us state at the outset, Christian. Yes. Yeah. State it from the outset. In doing what they're doing, in saying what they're saying, in acting the way they're acting, in in matters of mind and will, in matters of emotion, in matters of, of just pure action, saying this is what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, all of those things betray them. And that should be a blessing, in fact. It drives me nuts when people don't want to grant the unbeliever the the idea that they're self-deceived and that really deep down inside there's something that cannot, cannot escape the fact that they are created in the likeness and image of God. They're created in in his image. They are called to his likeness. And that they live and move and have their being in a world that he made. They can't escape it. And it has consequences. <laughs> it has consequences in the same way that you can't really think of nothing. It, the moment you do is the moment you objectify. You can't escape it. The philosophy of the assert is indeed nothing original in itself. It is entirely negation and its character is determined absolutely and entirely by that which it attempts to negate. The absurd could not even be conceived except in relation to something considered not to be absurd. The fact that the world fails to make sense could only occur to men who have once believed and have good reason to believe that it does not make sense. In other words, they're using reason. (laughs) They're using reason, and there are necessary preconditions to that. That does not operate. Those are not provided. Those necessary preconditions are not provided by just any any system. In fact, the contention of this show is that to the extent that other ones can, they're a reflection of the one who can the most. And the one who can the most, of course, is the Catholic worldview. Insofar as they deviate, They fall apart. In the end, missing the cornerstone, it crumbles. But in the meantime, grateful for the extent to which they've accepted said claims. Because those things are deep down, even within themselves. It's within them, all around them, above and beneath, within and without. Absurdism cannot be understood apart from its Christian origins. Christianity is supremely coherent. For the Christian God has order, has ordered everything in the universe, both with regard to everything else and with regard to himself, who is the beginning and the end of all creation. And the Christian whose faith is genuine finds this divine coherence in every aspect of his life and thought. For the absurdist, everything falls apart, including his own philosophy. 
which can only be a short-lived phenomenon. For the Christian, everything holds together and is coherent, including those things which in themselves are incoherent. The incoherence of the absurd is, in the end, part of the larger coherence. If it were not, there'd be little point in speaking of it at all. (laughs) Oh, come on now. And yes, Andrew, in the comments, no cross, no meaning. No cross, no meaning. No God, no purpose. No God, no being. No God, no way of knowing. No providing for the conditions of the one and the many. The means and the mechanisms that are required for us as creatures to make sense of the world, to make sense of ideas, concepts, even of ourselves. Much less of others. And what would be the point of speaking at all? Other than a big wah, wah, wah. I just want to be heard. (laughs) You're not doing a good job of being a nihilist. But you are, in fact, doing a good job of, of being a creature created in the image of God. And knowing deep down inside that no matter what you say, something, that void is not good for you. In fact, that void is the opposite of everything that God created you for. Your your desire for the good, any desire for truth, any desire to know, any desire to have meaningful action, to have purpose in the world, to be remembered, to be loved, any of those things, the better angels of who you are, cry out against that. So even if, even if you sit there and say, oh, I believe it's all for naught. There's no purpose in any of this. I I opened up my eyes. I don't even know. You know, it's no purpose. No, I'm not going in any direction. I'm just making it up as I go in the moment. I'm living for right now, blah, blah, blah. Even if you do that, there'll be part of you that has to tell people, that has to reach out. It's really difficult for them to follow in the footsteps of Wittgenstein, who didn't follow his own footsteps that he talks about, (laughs) saying it's like walking up a ladder, finding yourself high up in the clouds, looking down and realizing that everything that got me here is completely meaningless. So I kick away the ladder and enjoy the uh, spend the rest of time in silence. Silently passing over all things. Even that is so absurd. But they can't. Thank God they can't. And this is why we shouldn't get so down. When we have heretics and schismatics and libertines and atheists and everything around us, you can't get down. It's an opportunity. And that is an evidence, by the way. It is an evidence that no matter how hard it is to deal with that in the moment, to deal with it, to accept it, number one, it is a great reason to keep on praying. And number two, it is an evidence, an evidence that you can bank on. Take it to the bank Bet the farm on this. It's an evidence that they're created in the image of God and that they are called into his likeness. That they live in a world of the one and the many. That they live in a world where their actions, their feelings, their thoughts, human history, their existence as an individual, as an individual within a a larger unit, be it a family, an organization, a neighborhood, a city, a state, a nation, Internationally, the globe, the universe, all of these things are, as a whole, purposeful, intelligible, meaningful. And the people are still something, something deep down inside is crying out and betraying, betraying the one who's crying. It betrays them. It reveals that self obfuscating thing that's going on inside of them, that error as St. Irenaeus talks about these errors, that there's a kind of self-concealing that goes on. Yet it's constantly popping up all the time. All the time. The second of the initial difficulties in approaching the absurd concerns the, the concise manner, the precise manner. Now, 
Yeah. And Light of Christ Press, totally with you, bro. Evangelization. Teleological is Catholic Christians, bro. Yes. Go out. Go out and preach that gospel. Make disciples. Baptize nations. To live at peace with your neighbors. To pray for princes. To pray for your your prelates in that way. To love others. To love God. And that way we can love him and serve him in this life and in the next. Yeah. We are saturated with purpose, aren't we? Don't you love that? Don't you love? It's not, people People can get sad. I, I've seen it. I felt that. Where I'm like, what's my purpose? You know, why, why am I, why am I here? Go back to the kids' catechism. Go back to the, like, the old St. Joseph ones or something. And just read the first couple questions. It's literally right at your kids' fingertips. So it's definitely at yours. To proclaim ultimate meaninglessness, one must believe that this phrase, in fact, has a meaning. <laughs> and thus one denies in the affirming it. That's the same kind of argument that uh, St. Bonaventure makes and St. Anselm makes regarding the indubitable knowledge of God. That even in affirming it, even in saying that they don't believe, you can say the words, but in saying it, it betrays something. Betrays a whole bunch of stuff, in fact. To assert that there is no truth, one must believe in the truth of the statement. And so again, affirm what one denies. And to the and to the and at, we're back to that point that they can say, well, it's true for me. And you go, well, whoop de doo, it's good for you. Whoop de doo. Why are you telling me? Are you like a chatty Kathy doll, like you know, Steve Martin talked about? With John Candy in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, you're just blah, 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 pulling that string blah, blah, all the time. You just can't shut your yapper. Or is it more likely that deep down inside you can say what you want about your espoused worldview, but you simply cannot live that way? You can't. And you won't. In part because you can't. Absurdism is, in fact, as we shall see, it is not a product of the intellect at all. It's a product of the will. Yeah. And this is one of those things, right? This is one of those things where I, I talked about uh, proving God, the, the chapters by Ronald Knox in the apologetics book that he was never able to finish before he died. And he talks about what's going to happen in this impending, this, this storm that was coming. He could see it on the horizon. And he was talking about the, the, and he's not alone. This has been going on for a long time. Debates internally within the Catholic world over apologetics. How to best address people. What are, what are the weaknesses of traditional arguments? They've gone through different phases at different times and they hold on to things for a wide variety of reasons. But he recognized in an age of the will, that he, he, he anticipated was coming, that there was no way to stop the impending doom of what we call on this show, we call secular age, following the footsteps of Charles Taylor with a, a great book on that. And he said, what do you do? And for him, it was to get back down to, to the, the, uh, the core, what he believed to be the core to mystic argument regarding contingency. And his reason is way more interesting to me than anything. His reason is because in his estimation, that was the, the argument whereupon the, it, the, the others presupposed. He at least recognized two things. Number one, Catholic presuppositions that were taken for granted in a world where the social imaginary that people had, the way they could view things being possible or real or acceptable, called a social imaginary, right? The idea of that being formed by Christendom in the West. The dominance, the dominion of the Christian religion for so long. And that when that goes away and begins to fade away and you see 
those, those holes, like we were saying, from the void beneath the surface begin to shoot through and geysers over here and a geyser over there and a little sinkhole here. And you're feeling the moles beneath the surface as you step on it, like, a, like one of those tunnels, right? Like a mole hill and you step on it, you realize it's a lot bigger underneath. I like a like a ne- a home, a little nest there of fire ants. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is actually way deeper. There's a lot of wicked crap in here. <laughs> this is wicked bad. That that he saw that as that's happening, those are things beneath the surface. Those are things that are taken for granted. Those are things that are presupposed. That we just assume. In fact, we assume them so much we don't even normally like talking about them. And when we do, we get confused. <laughs> See, what, what are you talking about? I presuppose it. So what? Who cares? I don't care. And you go, it's uh, really important. These are preconditions, man. These are ultimate authorities in regards to why you do and think and say the things you do think and say. It's your worldview. It makes sense of every argument and the mere act of arguing at all or the mere fact of, of, of there being facts at all or evidences at all or arguments at all, coherence at all, correspondence at all, reality, being, becoming, one, many, all that stuff wrapped up under the surface, in the background, taken for granted, under attack. Knox saw it. So did he. The absurdist revelation, after a long period of underground germination, bursts into the open in two striking phrases of Nietzsche, so often quoted. One, God is dead, right? Meaning that we killed him, modern man. The other one, there's no truth. The men have abandoned truth revealed by God. They've abandoned it because they no longer find it credible. Both statements are indeed true of what has become the vast majority of those who were once Christian. Even over the ever-decreasing minority who still believe, and think about this for a second. Just think about this. That this is true, right? That there's a kind of indifference and a kind of confusion even even over the ever-decreasing minority who still believe, inwardly as well as outwardly, for whom the other world is more real than this one. Even over these, the shadow of the death of God has fallen and made the world a different and a strange place. Selah. Just meditate on that. We've talked about it in, in secular age, saying that even the, even the people who call themselves r- r- proudly reactionaries or uh, call themselves traditionalists or call themselves orthodox or anything else that they want to call themselves, even these individuals have been impacted and in fact, in many ways, infected with the kind of modernity and the kind of absurdity and nihilism that is all around them for a long time. It's, Imagine the idea that it didn't. Do they have a constant awareness of all of their most basic assumptions and how that has impacted their lives? Do, have they taken a good, a good uh, amount of time to really reflect, to take an inventory on the many different ways that they may in fact be far more uh, uh, enthralled and completely absorbed in modernity than they even realize? It's a subtle thing. Social imaginaries are a subtle thing. Presuppositions are beneath the surface. They're foundations. We're so caught up in all of the things all around us that it's really rare that we really think about foundations unless, of course, we start to feel them falling through. Thankfully, thankfully, if we ever see or feel as if the foundations are falling through, then those foundations are man-made. And that's a good, that's a good thing. It's kind of like if you're, if you're in a house and you've got, you've got this ceiling that seems kind of low and it's kind of garbage, <laughs> right? Like made in, in the 60s or something. You're like, that's, that's not very good looking. Or in the 80s, you know? 
And you sit there and you, you start, you, you peek up above it and you realize that right up there up high is a beautiful, beautiful ceiling. Or the carpet has a bunch of holes in it and it's starting to get nasty and you rip it out and all of a sudden you realize that beneath that you have some of the most amazing wood floors you've ever seen. Don't fear that. Don't fear the idea of feeling the shifting beneath you. That only happens when there's sinking sand or it's, it's, a, it's a shallow thing. Beneath that, at the core of these things, how you know, how you're able to know things, how you are able to have certainty, how you are able to have meaning and intention and identity, purpose, motivation, will, free will, society, not just as an individual, but as a group, oneness, diversity, meaningful diversity, not crazy oneness that says there is a oneness, there's a, there's a oneness and a manyness that is balanced. Where the oneness does not absorb the many and the many do not annihilate the one. All of those things are, are you live this, by the way. You live in it, move and have your being in that world like that. And that's not because you came up with an awesome school of thought. It's because of God. God loves us too much to have allowed those kinds of things to fall completely in our hands. <laughs> and he's God. And we're contingent. Right? Everything in short has become questionable. The magnificent certainty we see in the fathers and saints of the church and in all true believers that refers everything, whether in thought or life, back to God. Seeing everything as beginning and ending in him, everything as his will, this certainty and this faith that once held society and the world and man himself together, it's gone. And the questions for which men once had learned to find the answer in God now have, for most men, no answer. It's a crazy thing. It's a crazy thing. You know, you sit there and you say, we live in a world where even, even a lot of people who are striving, right, to, to have that kind of certainty, they, they read about the saints, they love the saints, they invoke the saints for their intercession all the time. And yet there's something about it that on the one hand is natural, right? That we aren't, we, 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 uh, we're weak, right? <laughs> we're weak, we're frail, we struggle, all that sort of stuff. We struggle. And we do like, uh, you know, we do better and better all the time. That's our aim and our goal. But that's one of the reasons we invoke them the way we do, right? And yet at the same time, you can see where, a lot of people are at a place where the kind of dark night of the soul that they experience is all the time. It's not something that is attributed to an advanced state of spirituality and the ascent up a ladder of, of divine illumination or anything like that. It's just, no, it's just life, man. It's just life. And think about the kind of world we live in where that's happening. One that is far more safe and secure on a physical level, right? Just the amenities of life, the way that if you're sick, man, or you, you, we were talking recently, my son, I was telling him, you know, about the kind of crazy drugs people used to be able to buy inside of like, you know, convenience stores. <laughs> they, they weren't called convenience stores, you know what I mean? They're, it's the, the local market. You can walk up in there and buy yourself some heroin, <laughs> buy yourself some cocaine, some opium, you could do that, right? We were talking about it, and he said, well, why, why would that be? And I said, well, people, you know, enormous amounts of pain. You know, enormous amounts of pain, life expectancy way shorter. We weren't able to go and, and find help the way we do now if we were in a, in a bind and everything. And look, I'm not making a case that every single one of those things are good in and of themselves or perfect in and of themselves. At the same time, we take those things for granted, we take for granted the fact that for many people in the past, you end up getting a toothache 
You are going to die. <laughs> You're going to die. That infection is going to spread. You're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. You're going to go into sepsis. Good luck, buddy. Good luck. And yet, we live in a day and age of that. A day and an age. My, my grandma recently, 93 years old, my grandma, sitting down at the table with my dad, eating breakfast. She'd been tired for about a week. She's sitting there talking to my dad. And all of a sudden, my dad said, she kind of sounded a little confused, a little. And then just, but looked like she fell asleep. It was early in the morning. It's like five in the morning. And he's like, you all right? And she didn't respond. And then all of a sudden, she kind of snapped out and came back. And she's back, back doing her thing. And then it happened again. And again, her heart was going down to zero beats per minute zero he took her to the doctor stat she would have died they ended up doing a surgery through the leg put a put a little shunt in there stent whatever open up a uh, uh, pacemaker sent her home the next day in that world in that world in a world where we're surrounded by books like the devout life interior castle Right? All of these, these great spiritual, spiritual combat, any of these books, rosaries left and right, cars to drive to churches, wherever we want to go. In that world, somehow we are experiencing what appears to be a dark night of the soul like every single day. That it's just the norm. It's bizarre. Yeah. But they've experienced this. And the reason why is go back to Nietzsche again. In, in Will to Power, he comments very succinctly on the meaning of nihilism. What does nihilism mean? That the highest values are losing their value. There is no goal. There is no answer to the question, why? but we've lost this idea of certainty. In fact, this is one of those things that, that animated St. Bonaventure was this fear that the kind of philosophy that was coming in to the church that, and the musings that were going on at the time were going to lead to a place, maybe not even immediately, but it would lead to a place where little bit by little bit it's chipped away to the point where now it's purely a matter of probability. And that even, the, even those mechanisms necessary for probability would one day themselves be suspect. And yeah, in the comments, totally right here. Let's be honest, many of our dark nights of the soul amount to a lot of inconveniences. And that, that's my whole thing. The, the remarkable nature of this It says here, yeah, everything's become questionable. The magnificent certainty that we see in all the fathers and the church, right? In that way, it's gone. There have been, of course, other forms of coherence other than Christianity. And that's something that a lot of people, you know, they're like, oh, you're a presuppositionalist. You don't believe that anybody's able to have any kind of knowledge at all, or they can't explain various things by the natural light of reason. No, 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 no. Yeah, for one, contuition, come on now. But the idea being that he says this, I agree with him. In them, human life makes sense or it fails to make sense, but only to a limited degree. Not absolute truth, right? Not to that. And not to the peace that passes all understanding that proceeds only from absolute truth. Yeah. Never has such disorder reigned in the heart of man and in the world today, 
But this is precisely because man has fallen away from a truth and a coherence that have been revealed in their fullness only in Christ. Yeah. God is dead and there's no truth. In fact, these two phrases have precisely the same meaning. They are like a revelation of the absolute absurdity of a world who centers no longer God, but nothing. But just here at the very heart of absurdism, its dependence on Christianity that it rejects, it's most apparent. One of the most difficult of Christian doctrines for the non-Christian and the anti-Christian to understand and to accept is creation ex nihilo, out of nothing. Yet, without understanding that, the absurdist testifies to its reality by inverting and parodying it, by attempting, in effect, a a nihilization of creation, a return of the world to that very nothingness out of which God first called it. Now, this attempt at nihilization, this affirmation of the abyss takes its most concrete form in the atmosphere that pervades absurdist works of art. All right, talking about commonplace atheists, the vast numbers of artists whose insight does not go beyond the futility of the human situation as men imagine it today, and whose aspiration does not look back beyond a kind of stoicism and facing of the inevitable, the void is communicated by boredom, by a despair that is yet tolerable, and in general by a feeling that nothing ever happens. <laughs> and, and that's the absurdity, isn't it? They're bored in a world where there's more things to do than ever before. It's like, it's like the kids, they have, they have at least one more thing than people who lived before them before, uh, prior to video games and well, I'd say two more things, video games and TVs, then uh, that, that they have at least two more things than those who did not have those two things had. And they lived and did remarkable stuff <laughs> all the time. And boredom was there, no doubt about it. I think it's one of those things. It's a thorn. It's a, it's a, it's a blessing to have boredom. Some of the greatest things that have ever been done, including the greatest things ever done in my kids' rooms or around the house or in the yard have taken place at the, at the motivating drive, that motivating uh, uh, frustration that comes upon us in our boredom. And yet we're surrounded with things to do. The idea that nothing ever happens in a world where there's 24-7 news, we're inundated by it, overwhelmed by it on social media. Did you hear this? Did you hear that? Did you hear this? You could go on and on and on and on forever. And yet, nothing ever happens. Nothing ever happens. I'm totally bored. Nothing to do. But there's a second and more revealing kind of absurdist art, which unites the mood of futility, an element of the unknown. It's a kind of eerie expectancy. The feeling that in an absurd world where generally nothing ever happens, it's also true that anything is possible. Reality becomes a nightmare. The world becomes an alien planet wherein men wander not so much in a hopelessness as in perplexity, uncertain of where they are, of what they may find, of their own identity, of everything except this, the absence of God. They are left with a malaise in that way. There's a kind of subtle sadness that comes out a lot of times through music. Uh, James K. Smith in Secular Age, uh, in How Not to Be Secular, he uses as his example, which at the time that he wrote it made a lot of sense, used Death Cab for Cutie as an example. But you can hear it come through. The absurdist, though he denies human immortality, at least recognizes that the question is a central one. Something most humanists with their endless evasions and rationalizations failed to do. 
They're willing to live, right? They, they'll, they'll talk about being courageous. They'll talk about, about doing the right thing for all the right reasons. I just want to know what's true. But for some reason, they're willing to do that without the consolation of eternal life. Such an argument, in fact, is the worst kind of self-deception. And why? Because behind it, there's myriad masks behind which men hide the face of death. If man is, after all, to end in nothingness, then in the deepest sense, it does not matter what he does in this life. For then nothing he may do is of any ultimate consequence. And all talk of living life to the full is empty and vain. People get mad at the, the method of argumentation that I use, the method of apologetics. And they say, well, you're saying that, that if, if you don't have the Trinity, we can't account for the one and the many. Or you're saying that if we don't have God's providence, his plan, his design, if we didn't have any of that, we wouldn't have induction, for example. We wouldn't be able to distinguish between this or that. We wouldn't have universal laws. We wouldn't have immaterial logic. And yet, or, and, and you're, you're saying that we wouldn't have ethics the way that we act in our lives that we do. And yet, right, this idea that there's right and wrong, regardless of what this guy or that lady think, that we say, no, that's wrong. Very few people are willing to go out and go, yeah, rape, dude, that's not that. It's not really wrong. I mean, it's your position. I mean, you know. Even most rapists are going to admit that. <laughs> That's why they're hiding it. <laughs> That's why a lot of them got these weird kind of kind of uh, uh, masochistic things going on. They know that it's wrong. Unless, they're, unless their conscience has been completely seared or there's some kind of physical deficit. You know, frontal lobe problem, you know. And they get mad and they say, but I do good stuff. How dare you? And I know a lot of of, uh, uh, Catholic people who do bad stuff. And you're saying we can't know anything like that? Well, you know what? How do you explain all this stuff that we know? And they can, look, I invite them. Give me everything you've got, every good thing you do, every single thing that you think is amazing and all your reasons why. Give me every bit of evidence that you've got in the world and why you believe that evidence is even possible. Give me all of it because at the end of the day, I'll grant it. I'll grant it. Well, depending. (laughs) But I'll grant, I'll grant ability to do those things. I will grant the idea that there is good outside of yourself. And I will press the antithesis on our rationales and explanations as to why. Because at the end of the day, your worldview, insofar as it deviates from the truth, the way, the truth, and life that is found in our Lord, that comes from the truth of God being creator, and you being created in his image, called to his likeness, living and moving and having your being in a world that he created, insofar as you deviate from that, your explanation and accounting and justification and grounding of those things falls into pieces, into the same nihilistic abyss, in the same void that we're talking about now. Disillusionment, in a sense, is preferable to self-deception. If taken as an end in itself, yeah, so being disillusioned is preferable in this way to self-deception, it may if taken as an end in itself, lead to suicide or madness, but it may also lead to an awakening. Absurdism is the end of that road. It's the logical conclusion of the humanist attempt to soften and compromise Christian truth so as to accommodate new and modern, that is to say, worldly values. Absurdism is the last proof that Christian truth is absolute and uncompromising. Or else, it is the same as no truth at all. Then this world is all there is. This world is absurd. This world, in fact, would be hell. The absurd view of life, then, does express a partial insight 
It draws the conclusions of humanist and liberal thought to which well-meaning humanists themselves have been blind. Absurdism is, in the end, simply disillusioned but unrepentant humanism. It's, one might say, the large stage in the dialectical procession of humanism away from Christian truth. And we'll end here. To sum up our diagnosis of absurdism, it is the life lived and the view of uh, life expressed by those who can or will no longer see God as the beginning and end, the ultimate meaning of life. For it's quite clear that absurdists are not happy about the absurdity of the universe. They believe in it, but they cannot reconcile themselves to it. They can't live that way. They can espouse things. They can say that they believe one thing or another. They can say that, but they can't live that way. And again, people get bothered by me saying that. They say, well, look, you're telling me I don't really believe what I'm saying? And I say, in a way, yes. If someone comes up and says, there's no such thing as truth, there's, you know, we can't really know reality. Like, I don't know anything for certain at all. We know how to blow that out of the water. Just, just explode that argument to smithereens, okay? In that moment, did that person really believe that? They told you they did. They're arguing with you. Maybe even tooth and nail, using a bunch of examples as to why they think your position regarding truth is wrong. But it's not just that they think your argument is wrong. It's in saying what they're saying, they believe what they're saying is true. And yet they're espousing that there's no truth. (laughs) So you go, okay, is that person just a dumb idiot? Or is it, are you actually giving them the benefit of the doubt that there's something about them deep down inside, mysterious and difficult, primal, old school, down to the root, down to the core and the base of everything that they are in this world and that they'll be forever and ever, whether in heaven or in hell. And that in that zone, in that place, there is a great battle going on. The trauma has occurred. That sin has blurred and blinded. Hearts have been darkened. It's a gracious uh, diagnosis. And it's gracious and charitable because it's true, number one. And number two, it even in the description itself provides the answer regarding how they have to deal with that, what they have to do. For it's quite clear they're not happy. Even in their art and thought, they attempt to transcend it. As Ionesco has said, and here he speaks probably for all absurdists, quote, to attack absurdity is a way of stating the possibility of non-absurdity. And he sees himself as engaged in, quote, the constant search for an opening, for a revelation. He's grasping. He's reaching out and grasping all around. We're back to the Areopagus, guys. We're back to St. Paul in the book of Acts. We're right back there again. It is not far from you. Closer than you know. You are an ensouled creature. You are a living soul. The real faith of, of absurdism is in something hoped for, but not yet fully manifest. A Godot. That's the, uh, that is the always implicit but not yet defined subject of absurdist art. A mysterious something that if understood would give life some kind of meaning once more. But in the spiritual universe of Godot, waiting for Godot, G-O-D-O-T, in case you don't know. That's also where the thumbnail came from. I hope people who, who caught that, I hope you like that one. My kids did. Everything revolves precisely 
about the old self. And even a new God must present himself as a kind of spiritual merchandise to be accepted or rejected by a self that will tolerate nothing that is not oriented to itself. Men today may wait for a Godot with his sense of guilt obliterated in a frenzy of enthusiasm generated by a false mysticism of the earth, a worship of this world. They're waiting. But there's the, there's the key. They're waiting to evaluate, to determine for themselves, is that the true one? Is that what it is? Not even realizing that the tool that they're using is the same tool, in fact, that led them to this place. Putting Godot in the dock. Just as people in the West put God in the dock. Saying God had to match up to their reason. God had to, it's a different thing than to say, it's a different thing than to say that you cannot, uh, someone can say, you can provide reasons, which we do on this show, reasons to believe. One of those reasons is that without God, you would not have reason. <laughs> without God, you wouldn't have necessary preconditions, things that are required, ingredients, necessary ingredients that are required, okay, for reason or evidences or fact or uh, uh, the trustworthiness of your senses, the meaningfulness of, of history, the meaningfulness and intelligibility of time, progress, regress, the one and the many, all that stuff. And on the other hand, to say that, that uh, I'm going to put God in the dock and every single thing he says has to go through me and I'm the only one that can give assent. Otherwise, he, he, he is left at the behest of my own scale of judgment. And that's what they're doing in Godot, in his example, in his use of it, is to say, at the end of the day, they're still stuck in that place. The philosophy of the assert is not, therefore, founded upon a total lie, but upon a deceptive half-truth. Absurdism is, in the end, an internal and not an external question. It's not the world that is irrational and incoherent. It's man. If, however, the absurdist is responsible for not seeing things as they are and not even wishing to see things as they are, the Christian is yet more responsible for failing to give the example of a fully coherent life, a life in Christ. Christian compromise in thought and word and negligence in deed. I love that. Thought, word, deed. We begin every show talking about that. We say, we put, we, we take a knee every single time. Every single day we take a knee and we resolve to subject ourselves. Not to stand over God and make judgments over that. To recognize that he is the creator and I am the created. He is not contingent upon anything. I am. His knowledge is not contingent. Mine is. There is no me putting God in the dock. But our compromise in thought and word, our negligence and our deeds have opened the way to the triumph of the forces of the absurd, of Satan, and of Antichrist in this world. The present age of absurdity is the just reward of Christians who failed to be Christians. The only remedy to it lies at this, its source. We must again be Christian. Camus was right when he said, quote, we must choose between miracles and the absurd. 
We must again be Christian. It's futile, in fact. It is precisely absurd to speak of reforming society, of changing the path of history, or emerging into an age beyond absurdity if we have not Christ in our hearts. And if we do have Christ in our hearts, in the end, nothing else matters. And there he is. <laughs> there it is. Uh, I love this show. I'm glad you were along for the ride. Went a little longer than normal. I've been gone, though. I've been doing all sorts of stuff, right? Trying to get ready for this, trying to get ready for that, making big moves. Keep us in prayer, by the way. We're trying to do the best we can, doing the best we can with what we've got. And we trust God for it all to say, God, you're too good. You're good all the time. And I'm rejoicing because today is an awesome day. And it's an awesome day every day because I get to hang out with my family. I get to hang out with an amazing parish, an amazing school, right, at Sacred Heart Academy, with amazing friends and people that I work with in this really awesome thing that I do called Paleo Crat Diaries. I love it. And I hope you do too. And if you do, go check us out on Patreon. Check us out. More than that, more than that. Of course, we, we have a PayPal, all this stuff. If you want to reach out, eh, email's on there. I hope you do. But we have a Telegram. That's a community of people that get together and talk with live chats and all this other sorts of really awesome stuff. And I love that place. I was away for like three weeks <laughs> because it was the end of the school year. Or it was the end of the summer, beginning of the school year. We had all these things going on. And now finally, finally, it's falling back into place. And there's a foundation there. There's a foundation, an amazing dance floor to move all around, to get on our knees, crying out to the Lord, howling to the sun, because we love him, because we love God, and because we love one another as God wants us to do. We love to learn, but we're learning so that we can live right, drawing closer to God, becoming more in his likeness, and calling all of those who are created in his image to follow us. Next time, I'll be at Telegram right after this. Until next time. Never give up, keep on smiling, and momentum more. I wanted to make people dream bigger thoughts.